In the 20th century, governments have killed over 262 million of their own citizens, and this doesn't even include wars. But what should be as no surprise is, all of these citizens were unarmed. Over 262 million men, women, and children were shot, beaten, knifed, burned, tortured, starved, frozen, crushed, or worked to death by their government. I mean, it goes on and on. Some of them are still happening today in the Sudan and other places. Uh, what is the common denominator in all of the governmental genocides that have happened? Gun control. Every single time, without question, without exception, gun control is initiated before uh, the, the mass genocide. Ruled by leaders like Stalin, Mao Zedong, Hitler, and Pol Pot, these bad guys with guns brutalized their unarmed citizens, and there was nothing they could do. Government's like fire. It's a, it's a uh, powerful servant, a dangerous servant, and a terrible master. But it's considered a necessary evil because people want security, and so they'll seek government in the name of security for the people, but they're very dangerous. My brother was a freshman at Kent State University when he was in the Prentice Hall parking lot and the Ohio National Guard fired upon him and his peers. And next thing you know, there were four students dead. I remember being in synagogue as a little girl with my grandmother and she would say the phrase, never again, never again. That's supposed to be a call to action in which Jews study the Second Amendment here in this country, not just Israel. From the dawn of government 5,000 years ago in ancient Sumer, governments have tortured, stabbed, buried alive, drowned, hung, decapitated, and slaughtered their citizens by the millions. The victims always unarmed, helpless, hapless, and hopeless. People who have been denied the right to keep and bear arms down through history generally are at risk of persecution uh, and tyranny from their own governments. And quite frankly, if the American colonists had not been well armed, they would never have had their revolution. Known as kingdoms, city-states, regimes, dictatorships, nations, and even democracies, a government is little more than a group of people who have been able to amass enough power to command and kill the rest of the people around them, if deemed necessary. There's always a movement uh, by the part of government to restrict the liberty of the people to make it easier to control. Uh, that's something that we have literally seen throughout history. Thus, through the ages, kings, emperors, sultans, khans, and all manner of rulers have captured little towns and cities, raped, pillaged, and massacred their populations, and left entire lands burned and in ruins. Kings, rulers, tyrants, czars, whatever, have ruled the people from top-down authority. We found governments that uh, have impressed and took away people's agency in bonded, I guess you'd say, to the point that the government had unlimited power. Hebrew kings would put to the sword all those they conquered. Assyrian rulers would reward their soldiers for every severed head, ear, nose, or hand they brought home, especially the body parts of nobles. Throughout history, we have seen gross abuse of people by either conquering armies or by their own government. Not even today, look at Mexico. You've got a narco state, basically, and the cartels there use the terror of beheadings and, and torture and mass rape to control the population. So it's the same pattern we've seen throughout history. The ruler of Sargon had the king of Damascus burned alive, his wives and daughters raped and placed into harems. Entire populations have routinely been massacred by ancient armies. The heads of unarmed victims brought back as trophies so numerous they can only be counted by full-time royal scribes. And slaughter like this went on for centuries, not only in classical times, but as recently as 1210 when church and state were still linked. When you look at, at the excessive 
persecution of governments throughout history. It really is mind boggling. The vast majority of people, once they realize that they are incapable of resisting government, the will to resist usually follows pretty quickly. This is what governments do. Torture, massacre, rape, pillage and enslave, and they've been doing this for 5,000 years. But when the gun was invented, it became the common man's defense against the power of a tyrannical state. It became the common man's defense against the power of the sword, for the sword has killed millions more than the gun. An unarmed man is attacked and uh, victimized a lot easier than an armed man. And it's both by government or by criminals. But isn't it amazing that in the United States of America, common ordinary citizens defend themselves with their own personal weapon over a million times a year? In a society without guns, then the strongest would control everything. The elderly, the young, the sick, the weak would be ruled by everybody that was strong enough to pick up a rock or, or, or whatever. Uh, a gun is an equalizer. That's why the founders of the United States institutionalized the right to keep and bear arms in the Second Amendment and the three militia clauses of the U.S. Constitution. But today, this right is being threatened by people known as the gun control lobby. Military-style assault weapons have but one purpose, and in my view, that's a military purpose, to hold at the hip, if possible, to spray fire, to be able to kill large numbers. The present gun control lobby is really driven by ideology, and that ideology is based upon the concept that central control by a very powerful political apparatus, ultimately a totalitarian state type apparatus, is what is necessary for maintaining a proper social order and advancement and so forth and so on. So the last thing they want to have in a position of, shall we say, balance against the government that they would like to see put in place would be a large armed and organized uh, population because that would tend to suggest from the ideological point of view that those individuals might have control over the political system. The gun control lobby, through their lackeys in the mainstream media, uses horrifying mass shootings as justification for disarmament. It is against this background we must take a look at both mass shootings and tyrannical governments and assess the overall threats and risks presented by each. It is correct that the probabilities of mass shootings are greater than the probabilities of tyranny simply because of the number of people that could engage in a mass shooting. Almost anybody could engage in a mass shooting. But the number of people that could engage in tyranny is very small. The authorities, the people who control the police and the military, those are the individuals who could impose tyranny on a system. The FBI defines mass shooting as four or more people killed, not including the perpetrator. History documents that there was but one mass shooting in 150 years of colonial America, and that event was at Enoch Brown School, where 10 were killed on July 26, 1764, by four Lenape Indians. Of course, the colonists killed endless Native Americans before and after the Enoch Brown Massacre, but in general, Americans weren't shooting each other. Mass shootings, as a rule, happen in gun-free zones. What we have, therefore, is a sitting duck scenario. We have somebody that, for some reason, decides they need to reach out and be violent towards society. And unfortunately, they pick areas where there is no one that's able to shoot back. You never see mass shootings at uh, gun ranges, you don't see them at events where people are armed. You see them 98% of the time where nobody is able to shoot back. The first intra-citizen shooting didn't happen until 1893, when four were killed at a high school dance in Plain Dealing, Louisiana. Five years later, in 1898, 
there was another shooting of six at a school exhibition in Charlestown, West Virginia. No further mass shootings happened in the 19th century until 1940 when five kids were killed in South Pasadena Junior High in California. After the shooting at Pasadena Junior High, there were 23 more mass shootings in public places up to the present day. What he had been doing in the church is he would shoot somebody and when they would go down, he would walk over and he would finish them off. And he had just shot Chris Workman in the back and he had just shot Chris's mother twice and he was walking over to finish them off. And people in the church heard me yell and he heard me yell and he came out at that moment and, and he came out of the church shooting at me. Twenty-seven mass shootings with 428 citizens killed from colonial America to the year 2018. 414 of these killed in the 20th century. Terrible thing. But with tyranny, you've got armies and police forces, thousands of shooters, and you have millions and millions of people who are the victims. Once you take away the ability of the people to defend themselves, um, then you wind up what you saw in Stalinist Russia. Like Solzhenitsyn said, you know, by that point, they, they, had, they had, uh, didn't realize what they were getting into, didn't realize what was going to happen to them, and they didn't fight back when they should have. Hundreds of millions of citizens killed by their own government, brutal governments. Governments have killed about 262 million citizens in the past century, and mass shooters have killed about 414 citizens in the past century. If these statistics are correct, simple math tells us that governments have killed about 633,000 times more citizens than mass shooters. So, who's the bigger risk? Armed citizens or tyrannical governments? When you compare the, the deaths that have been committed by individual criminals, they do not compare to the carnage, the death, the destruction, the murder that has taken place by governments. The founders believed that the, the citizenry should always be armed in case they had an authoritarian government that they had to rein in. That was, that was their belief and their conviction. 260 million people who've been murdered by their own government. Given an understanding of the difference between the risk of armed citizens and the risk of tyrannical governments, why would anyone want to infringe the right of citizens to keep and bear arms, unless they are profoundly ignorant of history or they have some hidden agenda? The gun control lobby would deny that they have a hidden agenda, but I am convinced from the many years that I've spent in Washington that those that are at the hub of power, they are seeking control. And one of the major ways you get control is to reduce the number of guns that are available to people and then at the same time try to have the schools inculcating the idea that only the police and the military should have guns. Um, they're making it very easy for you to be disarmed now with these red flag laws that can, can selectively disarm almost anybody based upon just a mere um, hearsay allegation against them in an ex parte hearing with no opportunity to confront your accusers. You don't even know it's happening until it's done. And so their goal is obvious. The goal is to, dis to disarm the American people. And they see us as being in the way of their utopia, which is basically a communist utopia. Given the track record of governments and the history of mass shootings, the two most obvious reasons citizens of any country should be armed are deterrent against tyranny and self-defense. Failures of government on the one hand, and then excesses of government on the other hand. Talking about failures, in a sense summed up in the uh, aphorism that when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. Uh, even exercising the extreme of goodwill, the average government is simply not in a position to defend every citizen at all times against all of the possible criminal attacks that could arise. Now on the other side, we're talking about tyrannical governments. 
through secret police apparatus or martial law, whatever would be the method for suppressing the average individual. And some governments have really fine-tuned that operation. And that's another reason why people would want to keep and bear arms, to forfend the possibility that a government would move in that direction, or if it did tend to move in that direction, that people would be capable of resisting it. Sports and hunting, and even self-defense against mass shooters, are fairly straightforward. But what kind of arms would be necessary to defend citizens from a tyrannical government, such as the ones we have seen throughout history? The answer to that question is easy. The same kind of weapons such tyrannical government would use against its citizens. And this is exactly what the U.S. Constitution provides for in not only the Second Amendment, but in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15. A government that is tyrannical would be expected to come at its citizens with infantry, or SWAT supplied weapons, uh, or spec op weapons for spec ops. The uh, paramilitary deployed post-2013 Boston Marathon bombing in Watertown, Massachusetts. There were Humvee-mounted machine guns deployed in Watertown, personnel with long guns. You could expect uh, vehicle-mounted sound weapons, uh, water cannons, uh, tear gas, projectiles to disperse pepper spray. Something to keep in mind is that even in Stalinist Russia, they didn't use the, the Russian army against the Russian people. They used the secret police. You're not going to get the average Russian grunt or American grunt to turn on his own people. You, you rely on those who either they're sadistic by nature or they'll just do whatever they're told. It's a very much smaller pool of population among the armed uh, professionals who will carry out those orders. It's not your average National Guardsman or average infantryman who's gonna be coming to your door. It's gonna be someone who has a vested interest in his career who can be pressured in the following orders for his pension, for his security, or like I said, because he already um, doesn't mind doing it. He's amoral and, and is a sociopath. And that's why when you have the ability to resist them, there's only so many secret police, as Solzhenitsyn pointed out. The machine will grind into a halt because of the lack of the vetted secret police officers who are willing to do the orders. Again, what kind of weapons are needed to repel invasions and suppress insurrections? Muskets and BB guns? The tyrannical government enforces its edicts one individual at a time. It is not looking for confrontations with large groups of hostile citizens. So typical enforcement of tyranny comes through police enforcement. One or two armed officers descending on an individual or a small family and arresting them or some searching their apartments or whatever, some way terrorizing them. As soon as the resistance level rises beyond that of the family or the small group, then the tyrannical government has to turn to the machine gun, the armored car, and on and on you go up that ladder where the government is forced to turn to tanks and aircraft and armored helicopters and so forth. The government is in very serious trouble. This idea, well, you know, we can't beat them because they'll drop hydrogen bombs. And, uh, no, well, no, 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 no. You take New York City, what are they going to do to New York City? Is Cuomo going to ask for a hydrogen bomb to be dropped on New York City? I mean, it's ridiculous. Had citizens been armed, we would have never seen the Soviet Gulag, Nazi concentration camps, the Khmer Rouge, Turkey's purges, or Tito's slaughterhouse. But citizens need more than just weapons. They need training. Training is very important. Uh, I don't mean that you have to be the best of the best, but I believe that if, if you are planning on using your gun to defend other people, you should know how it shoots. And this is the exact reason the founders stated that a well-regulated militia is necessary. A well-regulated militia is uh, a local, county,
state government institution composed of the body of the people, they would be governed, they would be well trained, militia officer commanded and not commanded by any other military uh, departments within government. A group of well-trained, appropriately armed citizens at the service of the governor of their state. It is not the police, the army, the Navy, or the National Guard. It's regular citizens in all 50 states exercising their right to keep and bear arms for not only individual self-defense, but community self-defense. It's ironic that the banking capital of the world, Switzerland, relies on a militia to protect its country, yet the Hollywood Control Group endlessly despises or depicts or suppresses or vilifies the Second Amendment, and especially the first four words of the Second Amendment. So here we have a constitution that says a well-regulated militia is necessary to a free state, yet the Hollywood movies and the networks endlessly attack and suppress the Second Amendment. A constitutional militia is thus a community of self-defenders, a community of good guys with guns acting as an institution. A constitutional militia thus serves the most important reason we the people must keep and bear arms, as a deterrent against tyranny and as an address of tyranny. But some do not agree. They see the mass shootings and all they can proffer as a solution is to take away guns, especially weapons of war. This is the gun control lobby actively attempting to infringe the Second Amendment. The question of why the gun control lobby is uh, calling for gun control when I think common sense tells most people that it's not in the interest of most people. The trouble is we cannot see what they see. They recognize us as an obstacle to their goals. Their goals are a collectivist system with all power in the government and all people obedient to them and to the system. And therefore, what they're advocating, which is the elimination of guns in the hands of private citizens, makes a lot of sense, because otherwise they'd, they'd have some pushback to worry about. There's a famous movie about Schindler's List where he rescued so many Jews. But what they don't talk about is that at the beginning of the Warsaw Ghetto, Schindler smuggled weapons into the Warsaw Jews. And what happened is the first time the Nazis came in to round them up to bring them to extermination camps, the Jews fought back with the arms that Schindler brought into them. It's not a real favorite subject of the leftist media in Hollywood right now. They prefer to misrepresent firearms, misrepresent firearm owners, and misrepresent the capabilities of firearms. With the help of the mainstream media, the gun control lobby, by systematically omitting the two most important reasons we keep and bear, a deterrent against tyranny and militia duty, make ownership of weapons of war look unnecessary, if not foolish. I would describe the mainstream media as the dominant American media, the three major networks, uh, two of the three cable networks, all the major newspapers, Washington Post, New York Times, Boston Globe, and they have a dominant liberal ideology, which is not only promoted on their editorial pages, but I think more and more promoted on their news pages. And this, in effect, is an enormously powerful force. It is probably the most powerful force of American liberalism today, and it is one of the great forces that is pulling this country further and further to the left and further and further away from the kind of country it used to be. But what the gun control lobby and the mainstream media always fail to mention is this. Any body of citizens that can respond to a mass shooting can also respond to a tyrannical government. Mass killing psychopaths are in the halls of tyrannical governments as well as the halls of public schools. 98% of the mass murders in America take place in gun-free zones. You would think that with such an experience going way back into 1950, that we might conclude that gun-free zones are actually murder magnets. And so for people to insist that we can only be safe in a gun-free zone is to fly in the, in the face of almost 70 years of history. This is a really nasty, lethal idea. And the idea that somehow we ought to keep gun-free zones on our books 
is an idea that hopefully will be interred before the next mass shooting. But surrounded by all manner of bodyguards and private security, the gun control lobby wants weapons to defend themselves, but no one else. Their answer is always more police state, but never more good guys with guns, let alone a revitalized militia system. Isn't it uh, really ironic how many of the hypocrites in, in Washington, D.C. and in Hollywood have armed security guards that they can pay for? They don't believe common citizens should be armed, but yet they hire armed guards for themselves. They understand the importance of gun ownership, but they just don't trust you with guns. The hypocrisy is glaring. This is why we won't give them a seat at the negotiating table. Our Second Amendment is not up for debate. Every one of the governments that has slaughtered their citizens were police states. There were no good guys with guns allowed. Given this, it's safe to say police states don't work so well. If you're not sure about this point, watch one of our earlier documentaries, Molan Le Bay, to get a better idea of what police state is. So again, here are the five reasons citizens of any country should insist on being armed rather than relying on a police state. One, deterrent against tyranny. Two, constitutional duty to serve in the state militia system. Three, self-defense. Four, hunting. And five, sports. Let's now take a closer look at self-defense and see how good guys with guns as a metaphor for the militia system can stop mass shootings. The right to keep and bear arms for self-defense is not a right granted by any government. It's an inalienable right granted by God, the deity, nature, the universe, or whatever term you prefer. The rights come from God. And if God is made illegal, if God is removed from our, our dialect, from our schools, and from our, the halls of, of government, something's going to take that place. And government will try, if you let them, to take the place of God. And once they do that, you know, rights that government purports to create are also rights that they can revoke. And had citizens realized they had this right 5,000 years ago, history would not be replete with the slaughter of 262 million innocent people by their governments. So the right to keep and bear arms is something all human beings should be acutely concerned about, should enjoy, and should demand. It's unfortunate that they don't. All citizens in every country have the same reason that citizens of the United States have to keep and bear arms. And it really breaks down in, into two parts. One, every citizen has to face the fact that whatever government they have can in fact fail in providing protection to that citizen, usually against domestic criminality. And therefore, at, in those situations, defense falls upon that particular individual or that particular family or that particular small group of people. So that's a failure of government on the one side. And most importantly, citizens of any country would need to be able to execute under government supervision the common defense of life, liberty, and property. Ironically, there are three categories of human beings that have the inalienable right to keep and bear, but not always the ability to keep and bear. These are children, criminals, and the mentally ill. Most of the perpetrators of mass shootings are children, criminals, or the mentally ill. Unfortunately, the Constitution is silent on children, criminals, and the mentally ill. It doesn't uh, define who can bear arms and who cannot. That's why the labeling of children mentally ill and adults mentally ill is very concerning because that limits the liberty of an individual to bear arms. However, we can infer what the original intent of the Founders was by looking at the four places in the Constitution where the right to keep and bear is acknowledged and elaborated upon. The Constitution does not specifically define the category of individuals who are entitled to bear arms. It talks about the militia of the several states and well-regulated militia, and there it is talking about people who are 
required to bear arms. You have a duty as a citizen to perform that function. If you look historically, you will discover that militias enrolled individuals from 16 years of age upwards to 50 or 55 at the point where people became physically incapable of performing the necessary functions. Children, on the other hand, are perceived in law as not having rights until the age of majority. So even though God grants them the inalienable right to keep and bear, human society alienates that right. <laughs> That's the problem. The governments have been inter interfering and intervening in the natural rights given to us by God for centuries. As far as the age factor is concerned, that is primarily a family issue. That's not a governmental issue. It shouldn't be anyway. Jimmy, look at this it's clear these kids and their parents believe deeply in the right to bear arms at any age. What remains unclear is whether this new generation of shooters will bring new life to a $30 billion industry. There have been many, many instances where 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds have taken a firearm and have defended the members of their family. So the idea that children are not capable of using a firearm in the defense of life is just not true. Does teaching children to shoot guns make them safer? Tell us at Nightline. It is not the domain of this documentary to determine what the age of majority should be, except to say ages should seek to be consistent. For instance, the age to serve in the military should be consistent with the age to vote and own weapons. But prior to July of 1971, the age to serve in the military was 18, while the voting age was 21. During the Vietnam War, they were sending us to Vietnam, and we couldn't even vote for our representatives. Um, I, I helped uh, with my girlfriend. We collected petitions. We had a good case for, for making an amendment to the Constitution. Uh, if we were going to be fighting and dying for our country, we should be able to vote for who, who are the ones who are sending us to, into war. So that was the 26th Amendment, I'm not sure. Also, if a child of 18 can carry a weapon in war, but not at home, that's not only inconsistent, it's an invalidation of the child's abilities and responsibility level. As far as uh, the criminals are concerned, if you look back at the colonial period, you'll see that once he had served that sentence or paid that fine, he could now return to society, in a sense in a rehabilitated form, and once he was back in society, he now had all those societal duties, and one of them, of course, was service in the militia. Many people feel that felons have forfeited or waived their right to keep and bear because they have committed a crime against God's laws. Obviously, when people violate the laws of God and man in such an egregious way that they prove that they are untrustworthy of being allowed to possess a firearm, then those individuals have forfeited that right. At the same time, there are people who are charged with various offenses, have not harmed anyone, have never been a threat to anyone, and yet they've been adjudicated in court as being um, unable to possess a, a gun. And this is a serious question that really our, our society has got to address at some point. Most people agree that anyone who is incompetent or unaware of the dangers of guns should not have guns, especially weapons of war. But determining who is mentally ill is a sticky issue. The definition of mental illness is so bizarrely difficult to apply that nothing in general can be said about them in terms of their competence or their incompetence, that is, how irrational they are or how irrational they're not. A mentally ill person is anyone whom a psychiatrist or other health care provider officially says is mentally ill. These are the experts that decree whether the state's subjects are mentally competent or incompetent. 
I'm not sure what's happening here. I, uh... I need you to take off your clothes down to your underwear and remove all your jewelry. This should be a scary thought to any citizen that is uncomfortable with psychiatric drugs, mental institutions, electroshock, or mass shootings. Doors locked. Miss Valentini, are you refusing to cooperate? It's a very scary thing that courts rely on psychiatry to determine who is mentally ill and who is not. There is no science behind a mentally ill person. There is no blood test that you can take. There's no brain scan that you can do. There is no x-ray that you can do to determine whether or not somebody is mentally ill or not. It's an opinion. Innocent people have the potential to go to jail with testimony from a psychiatrist. It was one of the tricks that was used in the old Soviet Union. Whenever there was a, a dissident, a political dissident, they'd say, this person is crazy. And they'd take him into a mental institution and inject drugs into their veins and really drive them totally insane to prove their point. And then they'd be locked up and put in, uh, in straight jackets and so forth and, and tortured. If, for instance, you ask the average psychiatrist if he feels mass shootings are caused by psychiatric drugs, he will most likely say, no, they did the killing because they were mentally ill. Other psychiatrists maintain that the mentally ill tend to be peaceful, if not docile. It's only when activated by psychiatric drugs do they become aggressive or violent. We have a great deal of evidence that psychiatric patients were no more violence prone than anyone else. And there are studies of the people labeled mentally ill in the community and after discharge that do not indicate any increased rate in violence. But now that we have these stimulating psychiatric drugs that activate the brain and activate behaviors in abnormal ways, including both the antidepressants and the stimulants we give children, we do have increasing rates of violence in people taking these drugs. Most of the shooters have been through psychiatric treatment at one time or another. So the drugs we're giving our, our, our children and our adults make it harder for them to control their impulses. If they're just prescribing medication and not talking about nutrition and holistic remedies, then it is scary because they're not going to be able to make the proper diagnosis. But then you might ask, how come there was only one mass shooting in colonial America? Did they not have mental illness? The psychiatrist will then say they had mental illness, but they didn't have AR-15s. If you then say, well, they also didn't have Prozac, the argument will come to a stalemate, the place we are today. I developed the concept of medication spellbinding, scientifically called intoxication anosognosia, which means you don't know when you're intoxicated. Anyone who's dealt with people who are acutely intoxicated with alcohol knows that their judgment's impaired. They may think they can drive when they can barely walk or get the key into the door or into the ignition. People lose their judgment on psychiatric drugs. It is often the family who calls the psychiatrist and says, my husband, my wife, my child, my mother, is way over medicated. So in a sense, psychiatrists also suffer from medication spellbinding. There are no biochemical imbalance in the brains of psychiatric patients until they go to the doctor and the doctor gives them a psychiatric drug. Their frontal lobes where judgment takes place and self-insight takes place are impaired by the psychiatric drugs. It is greed and authority and power that impairs the judgment of psychiatrists. If the mentally ill do not tend to be violent, as some psychiatrists observe, the question we the people need to resolve is this. Are mass shootings caused by weapons of war or by people on psych drugs or by other things? Weapons are inert objects. They don't have the power to cause. It's only people who hold the weapons can cause those weapons to be used for some purpose. It's the people who are using the weapons that we need to focus on. The statistics are now there. 
that by far the majority of these mass shootings are committed by people who are on psychotropic drugs. It's as clear as that. It's the psychological condition that's induced in large measure by psychotropic drugs. We have many studies showing that people labeled severely mentally ill are not particularly violent. Their violence is generally associated with being abused in mental hospitals when they fight back against what's being done to them, or when the doses of their drugs are changed, or they're withdrawn from psychiatric drugs. But being spontaneously psychotic is not a major cause of violence. And in fact, these highly organized mass murders are not a characteristic of very mentally disturbed people. Guns have been freely available in this country since the colonial days. Every man who participated in the militia had a gun that he took home. For many decades since then, guns have become more and more available, but we don't have mass shootings at such a high rate until the widespread use of psychiatric drugs, in particular the antidepressants. According to Scientific American, one in six Americans are on psych drugs, and antidepressants are the most common type of psychiatric drug. But what exactly are psych drugs? Psychiatric drugs break down to basically antidepressants, antipsychotics, sedatives, hypnotics, anti-anxiety pills, and hypnotic sleeping pills. Popular brands are Adderall, Ambien, Celexa, Chantix, Lovix, Paxil, Prozac, Ritalin, Thorazine, and Zoloft. You are probably familiar with many of these names, given pharmaceutical companies spend millions advertising them every 10 minutes on network TV. 50 to 80 million Americans are on a psychiatric drug, and basically, if you take 0.1% of that amount of people and the side effects that are known to those drugs, which is increased risk of suicide and increased risk of violence, there is no doubt that these mass murders are linked to the side effects. So if one in six are on psych drugs and the U.S. population is 327 million, simple math tells us that 17% of the population, 55 million people, are on psych drugs. That said, even if a small percentage of these 55 million have adverse reactions, this translates into potentially thousands of shooters, terrorists, and or mass killers driving vans or trucks. Of course, if you've got millions of people on psych drugs and only a small percentage of them are having these, uh, these extreme reactions, that adds up to a very large number. Mass shootings and other atrocities have been escalating since the 1980s when a certain kind of antidepressant came on the market. These antidepressants are known as Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, or SSRIs. The term SSRIs refers to a group of antidepressants which were inhibiting the removal of a neurotransmitter serotonin from its proper place in the connections between the cells. The SSRIs do not cure a biochemical imbalance. They cause a severe biochemical imbalance in the animals they were tested on, and they do the same thing in human beings. All of them can cause akathisia and mania. Akathisia is a terrible irritability and inner anguish which can lead to violence. And mania is a euphoric, out of control mood that's extremely irritable and touchy and can lead to violence. Then it becomes an unpredictable, random reaction in the brain as the brain fights back against the drugs. 
producing an extremely unstable state, especially when the drugs are begun or when the doses are changed or the drugs are stopped and the brain can't catch up with the situation. The increase in school shootings over the same period in which there has been a massive increase in the use of the psychotropic drugs would certainly raise the suspicion that there's a connection between the two. You don't have a case for cause and effect at this stage, and you may not have quite a case for correlation because you have to show that the shooters so I had been taking psychotropic drugs, so you could make a connection between the drug and the actual shooter. So I would say it raised a very high level of suspicion that maybe one level of certainty below correlation. And then once you get the correlation and you can tie the shooter to the drugs, then we may get down to the next level of, of cause and effect. Because data about mass shootings are all over the map, we consulted a number of studies and averaged the findings to the following summary. Prior to the 1980s, mass shootings caused an average of 17 deaths per decade. After the 1980s, mass shootings caused an average of 92 deaths per decade. This is a 540% increase in the time period right after SSRI antidepressants like Prozac, Lovox, and Paxil became widespread. Although correlation is not causation, this is a serious correlation between mass shootings and SSRI antidepressants. The gun control advocates try to make it about the firearms, and yet we had no mass shootings in schools uh, back in the 1950s and 60s when you know, we had rifles all over the place. Even when I was in high school, you had teachers who would bring their rifles in to uh, trade off hunting rifles during hunting season, and no one batted an eye. What's changed is the minds of, this, of the young. They're on all these antidepressants, they're on all these psychotropic drugs. I believe the number of shootings has quadrupled since those became more prevalent. And they're also coming from broken homes and they're coming from a you know, no, no Christian moral base. And they, they're being indoctrinated in nihilism. They're being conditioned into socialist thinking in school, which leads to nihilism. The denial of, of, of rights, the denial of human nature, the denial of natural law, I think all of that plays, in, plays into a much greater um, role than anything to do with weapons. It's weapons, the weapons have always been there, but the desire to kill other people has not been there in the minds of young people. One must also consider the effect of direct-to-consumer advertising. When in 1997, the FDA made it easier for Big Pharma to advertise psych drugs to the masses on network TV. Drug companies are spending most of their advertising money on television, and it's almost impossible to watch TV for any length of time without seeing direct-to-consumer advertising for psychiatric drugs. When I first began my work criticizing the drugs publicly, I had access to all of the media. I was on all of the national news shows. I was on all the morning shows. I was on Oprah five times and Larry King five or six times. Then the FDA gave permission to the drug companies to advertise direct to the consumers. And the media became inundated, inundated with advertising for psychiatric drugs. After that, it became almost impossible for anyone, including me, to get on the major media and to talk about violence from psychiatric drugs. Oh my God, if you were on um, an SSRI drug that uh, somebody just took and who was fine one day and then the next day killed 10 people and that's the drug you're on, I don't know. I think it might affect some marketing. The media is not going to be like, oh, this is the drug that killed 25 people last week in Las Vegas. We are the only country in the world that advertised direct consumer drug advertisement. We are the ones that are telling you all the list of side effects and go ask your doctor about this. So they are making millions of dollars by blaming the collateral damage on guns. Until there are better studies of what drugs active shooters are on, it will be difficult to come by answers. Such information, if reported at all, is scattered all over the internet. Often it's downplayed or admitted entirely in gun violence compilations such as gunviolencearchive.org. 
shootingtracker.com, and even compilations on Wikipedia. Big Pharma controls most of the studies of psychiatric drugs. And when I say controls, I mean they buy the doctors who are doing the studies. They give the studies to the doctors and tell them how to do it. And then they tell the doctors they can't publish their results without permission from the drug company. And then the drug company has someone else write up the studies and pays doctors to sign their names onto it. This blatant and obvious omission of site drug data opens the door to the question. Do mass shooting archives exist to get to the core of the problem, or do they exist to serve the gun control lobby in its quest to justify the further infringement of the Second Amendment? In short, why do so many mass shooting archives itemize almost every fact connected with every shooting except what drugs the shooter was on? We have to expose the records of all mass shooters. I deeply believe in medical privacy, but we have such an urgent public need to show what many of us already know, which is that psychiatric drugs and psychiatric treatment in general are highly correlated with mass shootings. Occam's razor would suggest they want to shift the blame away from drugs towards guns. It's one of the most ugly chapters of scientific history to know that in our era, what we call big pharma, the pharmaceutical industry, is totally corrupt. Every single large pharmaceutical company has a massive court record of having so, deliberately falsified life. testing results to favor the acceptance of their drugs. They falsified the results, they've hidden uh, evidence of adverse reactions. And so they put these drugs on the market and they make hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in profits. It's a business model. They know that eventually somebody's going to sue them. And oh yes, they're going to have to go to court, and yes, they're going to lose a lawsuit. They're going to have to pay out millions of dollars in claims to compensate some family for the loss of a loved one or for their permanent disability. But it's peanuts compared to the profits that they have made. The, the fines are paid by the stockholders of the companies, and the managers who made the decision get pay raises and bonuses, and that's the way it goes. It's a very corrupt industry. If the laws could be changed so that individuals were responsible for these adverse reactions and deaths, I think you'd see the pharmaceutical industry and many other companies as well suddenly become a lot more ethical than they are. Contrary to Wikipedia and the gun control lobby's nebulous assessments, direct-to-consumer access of SSRI site drugs is probably a major cause of mass shootings, even though weapons of war can increase the severity of each event. Let's thus leave theories aside for the moment and move on to some realistic things that can be done to stop or at least attenuate mass shootings. Criminologists tell us that in 70% of the cases, a mass shooting is over in five minutes, but the police arrive in about 11 minutes. If we had the militia system in place, good guys with guns would be present all the time. Since we don't, we have two choices. Wait for the local police to arrive or rely on local self-defense. Obviously, churches should never be gun-free zones. And I'm going to tell you that there shouldn't be gun-free zones because when they stop the shootings at the schools, they'll move on to the next gun-free zone because the shooters are interested in doing nothing but creating as much chaos, as much killing, and as much loss as they can. Gun-free zones do nothing except keep people from defending themselves and their families and their friends. Wayne LaPierre of the NRA has a saying that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, and I totally agree with that. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. I was glad to see them champion Stephen Williford, the, uh, the hero of Southern Springs, Texas, 
who put an end to the, the uh, church shooting there. Uh, the NRA, because he'd been an NRA instructor in the past, they, they made him like pretty much their uh, example of a good guy with a gun. I think that's good. The reason why he was effective is because he was there. And he had decent training and he had an AR-15, he had a military pattern weapon. What they should say after that is, is, well, how come, why was it that the people in the church were not armed? They're in Texas, they're gun owners, but they weren't in the habit and weren't organized to carry the weapons in church. I'm not the bravest man in the world or anything, but I was here. I was here and I could do something. And I had to do something. So the next step is with the NRA to go all the way towards the good guy with the gun is the militia man. He is the, the you know, member of the militia. Everyone in the community must be armed. And it's a good example of why. The people inside the church, just like inside of a school, you must have armed people in the pool of intended victims. With the tragedy that just happened in Texas, my question is, how do you justify the democratic view on gun control when the shooter was stopped by a man who was legally licensed to carry a gun? Well, first of all, uh, the kind of gun being carried, he shouldn't be carrying. I don't know the exact year, but it was Senator Joseph Biden that introduced the gun-free zone uh, bill for schools. And unfortunately, it was signed into law. What we do with a gun-free zone is we tell people who are bent on committing a mass murder as easily as possible to look at schools. Recently, there was an article about a school who is putting a five-gallon bucket filled with rocks in each classroom. The idea is, is that if a mass shooter comes in, the students will throw rocks at the armed shooter. I, I, I wrote the first, the last serious gun control law that was written it was law for 10 years and it outlawed assault weapons and it outlawed weapons with magazines that had a whole lot of bullets and so you can kill a whole lot of people a lot more quickly. Making laws to order guns out of criminals' hands does not work because criminals do not obey laws. All this does is disarm law-abiding citizens, making them vulnerable to criminals. Thus, anyone that goes along with the chant of gun-free zones is actually abetting mass murder. These people should ask themselves, what would I do if a bad guy with a gun came at me in a school, club, or church? Would I be glad I was in a gun-free zone? It's clear that a gun-free zone of any kind, by hypothesis, is an infringement on the Second Amendment. And any statute that violates any provision of the Constitution is by definition uh, illegal and actually of not, no effect, no legal effect. Of course, they are enforced until some court eventually gets around to saying, no, this thing can't be enforced because it violates the Second Amendment. We have yet to see gun-free zones of any kind declared by courts to be infringements of the Second Amendment. It is thus clear that any school that is designated a gun-free zone is a dangerous school by definition. Dangerous schools should be shut down until they are not dangerous, until they are hardened. In the meantime, parents and children should have a choice as to whether or not they want to attend dangerous schools. This choice is known as the voucher system. Parents should also be encouraged to homeschool or private school, especially children subject to dangerous schools. I always say that I wish I was homeschooled in someone else's home, but homeschooled just the same. That would have been wonderful. I don't think there's any way that people who homeschool their children or send them to private school should pay property taxes that include taxes for public school. I believe in a la carte taxes, first of all, so that you're getting the service that you pay for, that you desire. I would really like to see a change in this country where we can pay property taxes based on the services that not only we believe in, but that we receive and that I think we should reward excellence, in other words. The theory is that everyone, whether he has a child or not, has some interest in educating citizens within his community. And so all of the landowners pay a property tax, and some of that money goes to the schools, even those landowners who don't have children of their own. But if you're talking about landowners, property owners, who have children of their own, and the property owners themselves are incurring the cost of homeschooling or private education, then the rationale for taking their property taxes for the public schools collapses. 
because they're doing the work of the public schools and in fact they would be doubly taxed in a sense because on the one hand they're paying for the private education and on the other hand they're being taxed for the public education. Therefore one would think that for homeschoolers and parents who send their children to private schools there would be some rebate or reduction in their property taxes commensurate with the amount of the expense that they're incurring to educate those children on their own. If the school districts refuse to remedy dangerous schools, property owners should vote out of office any incumbent who levies taxes for such dangerous schools. And if a mass shooting results in a school in which uh, administrators or public officials have not provided adequate security, those individuals should have some legal liability in damages or in other forms of liability, perhaps even criminal liability for criminal negligence. Right? That's one of the problems today that they go and they designate a school as a gun-free zone. They don't provide sufficient physical security. They don't provide uh, sufficient armed security. They don't train the teachers or the administrators or a lot of the teachers or the administrators themselves to be armed. Then a mass shooting occurs and people run around talking about how guns were responsible instead of looking at the people who were responsible. It's the public officialdom that's responsible for that security. They're requiring the parents to send those pupils to that school they're taking the responsibility for the education and protection of those children and then when they fall down on the job because of some psychopath with a gun, they blame the gun, not themselves. If local governments do not provide schools that are safe and stop infringing the citizens' right to self-defense, parents should refuse to support such schools. So what can the federal, state, and local governments that tax us to death do to make schools safe? The first thing, as discussed earlier, is ban the foolish and illegal practice of gun-free zones. Some schools have gone so far as to post signs to say that the staff in the school is armed and they will meet force with force. I believe that an armed shooter seeing that sign will pass by that school and look for a school that has a gun-free zone sign outside that door again lending credibility to the expression dangerous school unfortunately as we have seen in the news security guards and even police sometimes cower from active shooters leaving children and citizens defenseless this is another reason citizens must rely on local self-defense you can never have enough of a budget to really have enough security guards to provide security in every school in the country Eventually, they'll run out of, out of budget and they'll start scaling back as they have done in, in several states. It's easy to run onto a school campus today with a firearm and shoot up people. Sheriff Judd in Polk County, Florida has had a very successful program of arming and training the teachers and the school staff. He seeks out people that are either military police veterans or who are willing to go through the training. And a representative who works at the school is well trained and has a gun, do I want them to step out into that hallway and start shooting at that guy? Or do I want him to walk into the classroom with my babies and shoot them up? I don't want to be responsible to have to shoot someone. I mean, it's, it's bad to get shot, but to shoot someone, I mean, I don't know if I could live with that. My babies, your babies are in that classroom and that active shooter is coming down the hallway with that thousand yard stare and that gun in their hand, do you want somebody to step out and stop him? Or do you want them to go into the classroom and slaughter your babies? You can never have enough of a budget to, to really have enough security guards, armed security guards, to provide security in every school in the country. Eventually they'll run out of, out of budget and they'll start scaling back as they have done in, in several states. They've, they've trimmed back on their, on their school resource officer programs, for example. Well, I was going to talk about the teachers for a second because I was a teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe you don't want me to have a gun. There are countless veterans who will volunteer to serve as armed resource officers, as armed guards at our schools. 
They can go through a background check just like anybody else would. They've been trained by the U.S. government already. Have them be in plain clothes. It's very easy to concealed carry and not have it visible. So yes, having armed people at our schools, either inside and or outside the school, is a fantastic idea. If I don't see it, I really wouldn't even know they had it. They don't see a problem with the extra security. I mean, as long as it's for the safety of the kids, as um, long as you don't abuse the privilege of actually having the gun, um, I shouldn't see no reason why you know students should feel threatened if, if a faculty member has a gun. So the real solution is to arm and train the ones who are going to be there anyway. Already on salary, you're on the staff, you're, you're part of the teaching staff, or part of the school staff, you're already there anyway. Arm and train them. Both teachers and administrative personnel should be armed and or have access to arms in locked desk drawers or security cabinets. Presently, I am a high school teacher. I teach high school. I'm retired in law enforcement and now I'm a high school teacher. There are hundreds and thousands of former uh, military and police uh, who are already teaching who wouldn't even need to be trained. You would just need to, to devise a plan where guns are strategically placed throughout the school and I don't believe anybody should know where guns are placed in the school except those people and the administrators. These good guys with guns could be on a rotating duty roster. The armed duty schedule could be random and undisclosed so any would-be assailant will never know who is on duty, who is carrying, how many are carrying, or when they are carrying or on duty. This is a very controversial situation. But as a firearm instructor for well over 18 years, I believe that every teacher in every school that wants to be armed should be entitled and be given the opportunity. And I think the school board should pay for this too, if that individual teacher could not afford it. To avoid friendly fire accidents, the duty roster should be made known to the local police. Identifying insignia could be mounted by any teacher or admin personnel after he or she goes into action. I'm convinced that these kids are out of their brains. They're not acting rationally. Uh, they're not, they wouldn't think, well, somebody might shoot me because they're out of their skulls anyway. But if we had people on the scene that were armed, at least they could put an end to the shooting a lot sooner than they now are being done. These measures will be steps in the right direction. However, students should also have safe spaces they can retreat to. These safe spaces could be classrooms, lavatories, and the cafeteria. Obviously, the doors on safe spaces must be lockable and bullet resistant if possible. At the very least, every door should have a wide angled peephole so one can see who is banging to get in, a desperate student or a madman with a gun. All of these measures could convert dangerous schools into safe or safer schools. Hardened areas, the ability to fight back, coordination with local police. This is common sense defense, not gun-free zones, a harebrained solution tossed out by the gun control lobby and their puppets in the mainstream media. Maybe what we need to do is get rid of the whole federal gun-free school zone idea. And that, of course, would be the main goal. So teachers to be armed, and I think the ability for individual citizens who have the capability, and not to have to fear the government that if I come onto a school property with righteousness and the ability to be there in the event that something would happen to my child, you should not be debarred that opportunity. It follows that any congressman who passes a law that creates a gun-free zone or any judge that rules in favor of a gun-free zone should be actionable. If a law is contrary to the Constitution, if an act of Congress proposed bill would violate the Constitution. It's been well established by the U.S. Supreme Court that such a so-called law or act of Congress is no one void from inception and has no force of no force and effect. It creates no obligations and duties and incurs no liabilities if you don't, don't obey it. It's not law. An unconstitutional law is not law. It's an unconstitutional act of Congress. The most comprehensive definition of a dangerous school might be any school that fails to deploy measures like those suggested here. Again, children should refuse to attend dangerous schools and parents should refuse to pay property taxes that support dangerous schools. Pupils have been coerced to attend the schools and then the administrators or public officials in charge of those schools have not provided adequate security. 
So they have endangered those children by the combination of the coercion to attend and the absence of adequate security. And therefore they have been negligent in a civil sense and perhaps even criminally negligent given how much we know today about school shootings and how they occur. Basically now we have legislation moving through the government in response to the mass shootings that are taking liberties away. They're forcing psychiatric evaluations on parents in order for them to get back into school if their child is seen with a picture of an airsoft gun. True case that I'm working on in Morristown, New Jersey. I want her released immediately. She's coming home with me. This is Valentine. I understand your concern, but right now this is the best place for Sawyer. One aspect of the negligence of school administrators is their knowledge that children within those schools are on such drugs, in fact, may be taking the drugs as a result of some participation of the school in a medical program. Right? All of these children have uh, uh, attention deficit disorder and are given these types of drugs. That should be an immediate red flag to anyone in the school system saying, wait a minute, we are contributing to the possibility, down the road at least, that we're going to see some individual act out under the influence of these drugs in a mass shooting or other criminal activity. Look, I had a rough night. So, because of the multiple acts of violence, we're looking at another seven days. What? If we don't police this in some way, we the administrators are going to find ourselves subject to criminal penalties because our behavior is reckless. But there's more that should be done to stop mass shootings. Any politician or judge that passes or enforces a law infringing the Second Amendment should be voted out of office if not prosecuted. Term limits should be enacted to ensure such deep state apparatchiks do not become entrenched and pass laws that create dangerous schools or violate the U.S. Constitution. The deep state has been a problem in America since we were founded. Uh, today we call them bureaucrats in Washington, bureaucrats in our state capital or county seat of government. People in government are employees. The Founders gave us a Constitution and a Bill of Rights, and in that Bill of Rights, one of the rights that is protected is the right to keep and bear arms. As a constant reminder to the government, stay within your limits. We have taken a look at the various factors connected with the subject of mass shootings. We have looked at the what, when, where, and how, but now let's look at who benefits from mass shootings and why they persist. This may lead us to the common thread behind mass shootings. One hint about this common thread is that in 1963, a citizen was gunned down in a car in Dealey Plaza, Texas. The United States government then initiated a multi-million dollar investigation known as the Warren Commission. The Warren Commission was really designed to convince people of a predetermined story. That was Lee Harvey Oswald, he was a sole assassin, end of discussion. You, I don't think you want that. What you really need to do with the uh, mass shootings and psychotropic drugs is probably to have some major lawsuits in which the evidence would come forward as a result of discovery, testimony of witnesses, cross-examination, all of the laws of evidence that really allow you to get down into the very bowels of the question. You don't want a select group of people deciding this in the back room. You want it out in the open in front of a jury where there are two adversaries on both sides and all sorts of evidence can be tested, especially under cross-examination. It would be like that long series of cases involving tobacco companies. I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Is there some reason a comprehensive investigation of mass killings has never been conducted? Many researchers feel there is, and the reason for this is because chaos, mass killings, and a dangerous environment serve what's known as the globalist agenda. An intentional, coordinated campaign of fraud and deceit. As we allege in the complaint, it has been a campaign designed to preserve their enormous profits, whatever the cost. 
in human lives, human suffering, and in medical resources. The globalists themselves describe it as the New World Order, a wonderful age in which all nations are part of the same body. It's a one world government and it's an end of war because there are no nations to fight each other anymore, so they couldn't have any war. And all, all disputes would be worked out around a, a conference table and there would be no injustice, there would be no suffering, and there would be no poverty and all of this sort of thing. That's how they like to describe the globalist agenda. Now, those of us who would have to live under it and wouldn't be sitting at the top issuing the orders have a little different view of it. We would be the ones that would have to serve those masters. We would have to be uniform. We'd have to be like everyone else. We'd wear the same clothes. Anybody who stepped out of line in terms of activity or even thoughts would be considered a hate criminal or something like that. It would be a horrible world in which to live. The globalist agenda, dismissed by the mainstream media as a mere conspiracy theory, is more than a theory. It's an observable set of smaller, interdependent agendas that are motivated by profit, politics, and control. Here are some scenarios that illustrate how these bad guys with guns operate. Big Pharma makes billions of dollars by selling psychiatric drugs, the drugs many, if not most, mass killers are on or coming off. Big Pharma uh, would very much like us to ignore the fact, and the media seems to cooperate with th this notion, that uh, we, we don't need to talk about uh, all of the mass murderers who have been on or have just come off of psychotropic drugs. Studies have shown that Big Pharma and the FDA have a cozy relationship, often a revolving door relationship. Now, under new law, Big Pharma pays the FDA to expedite the process of getting their drugs approved. So imagine the dependency that that creates where the drug companies can choose to give money to the FDA to make their drugs get approved faster. You don't think that also gets their drugs approved more frequently? And then on top of that, FDA officials double dip by retiring and going to work for Big Pharma. There's hardly a big distinction nowadays between Big Pharma and Big Government and the FDA. And it's obvious that psychiatrists and regular MDs are receiving endless business from the endless sale of Big Pharma because every advertisement on network TV tells millions of viewers to ask your doctor if we Prozac is... Your Don't care, yes. doctor, about the healing purple pill. Talk to your doctor. Bear in mind, doctor, this documentary doctor, is not saying that all of Big Pharma's products is without merit. There's a real place for all kinds of drugs in the treatment of individuals uh, with physical illnesses, especially acute physical illnesses like pneumonia, that, uh, where it can be life-saving. Psychiatric drugs are not the same. They don't treat physical illnesses. None of the so-called illnesses that are treated by psychiatric drugs have a known physical basis and in no case does the psychiatric drug address a biological defect. Psychiatric drugs work by disabling the brain, muting the brain, crushing spontaneity, making people less aware of their feelings and blunt in regard to their feelings. The final common pathway of all psychiatric drugs is to make us less aware of ourselves and less in touch with our emotions. Given the ridiculous list of side effects active shooters are exposed to, are the American Psychiatric Association and the American Medical Association really doing their jobs? It seems side effects are worse than the diseases. The Psychiatric Association is a group of psychiatrists that basically vote in disorders. So by a show of hands, they decide on these disorders. So again, we don't have any blood work, we have no brain scans and no x-rays. So if, let's say, for instance, the subject, subjective label of ADHD, the Association of Psychiatry sat at a table and raised their hands and voted in this disorder into their 
Bible that they use to bill out the United States government and they use it in school systems and they use it in private settings and so that's the association of psychiatry. The medical association is a more of a broader, well accepted, you know, science-based um, organization. The American Psychiatric Association and the American Medical Association are trade unions to enforce the power and wealth of physicians. They are not public service institutions. There's a great organization out there called the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, CCHR. And you can go onto that website and you see all the side effects of the drugs. You could actually plug in the drug name and see what side effects that drug causes. Is the FDA protecting citizens from psychiatrists and MDs who violate the Hippocratic Oath by subscribing drugs worse than the diseases or by unjustly enriching themselves by pimping Big Pharma's product? People get bamboozled into taking psychiatric drugs because life is difficult. Everybody struggles. Everybody has some anxieties, some guilt, some shame, some anger, some difficulty. And that's just taken advantage of by psychiatrists who claim they can essentially cure life's problems by drugging people. And many of the things that they're drugging are fundamentally spiritual problems. Is my life worthwhile? Is there a reason to live? Should I stay married? Is it wrong to get divorced? Do I have the courage to get a better job? Many others result from childhood, child abuse, child trauma, child deprivation. None of these things really fall under the authority of physicians who don't know anything about them. Excessively drugging a population is a hallmark of control, something one could consider an element of a larger agenda. The relationship between Big Pharma and the FDA is um, unconscionable. I think they call it um, regulatory capture is the phrase, meaning that the regulators have been captured by the pharmaceutical industry. It is clear that the purpose of the regulatory agency called the FDA today is merely to be kind of a uh, sales promotion agency for the big pharma. Other than profit motive, a political motive is also alive and well in the DC swamp. It is generally well known that Republicans tend to support the warfare state and Democrats tend to support the welfare state. The welfare state simply is dependency. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I think, engineered this in America with the New Deal. I think it's one of the great problems that America has because too many people are dependent on something, just like a drug. Why are we not teaching how to create wealth in schools? Why are we dumbing that down to make it look like it's evil? That's wrong. The warfare state relies on extending the national debt in order to fund the deficits caused in no small part by military industrial complex spending. And post 9-11, which many high level researchers feel was a false flag operation, we have seen the emergence of a security state and a police state both covered in our previous documentary, Midnight Ride. Well, the Patriot Act was passed rather quickly um, shortly after 9-11. It was the mood of the times, people willing to sacrifice their liberties for a sense of security. But Benjamin Franklin was very clear, you know, if you, if you sell out your liberty for security, you end up with neither. And unfortunately, that's where we are today. Well, a police state or a security state is the nice label that's given to a dictatorship. Anytime you start insisting that people must give up their rights in order to have more security, you go down that slippery slope. And then all it takes then is for the ruling elite to capitalize on that situation and use that to permanently entrench themselves. The military industrial complex, the security state and the police state, all elements of the globalist agenda all profit directly or indirectly from mass shootings and perpetual war. That's what constitutes the military industrial complex and what Eisenhower warned against is this force and its influence in politics 
basically to be a self-generating force that could dominate the nation's decision-making, and he was very leery of it, and rightly so. Again, anything that makes the environment become or seem more dangerous or chaotic. The more chaos we have in our land, whether it's riots in the street or mass shootings or whatever, it becomes kind of an excuse for the political elite to convince us that the system has to become a police state in order to protect us against all of this violence. We have to have surveillance cameras everywhere. Uh, we have to have road stops everywhere. Uh, we have to have um, laws that allow the police to come into our home at any time without a warrant. We have to have laws for them to tap our telephones because it's to protect us against all of this violence. And so, yes, there is a profit potential there to the military industrial complex to have violence in our society. Mass shootings can work to the benefit of the military industrial complex and the national security state because they increase the level of near irrational fear among the general population. Mass shootings are these events that occur out of nowhere. We really have no explanation for why they happen. People are killed. We don't know how to deal with them. We need more security. All of that feeds into a climate of national paranoia. And national paranoia will rationalize the ratcheting up of police activities, security state activities, national security activities, military industrial complex expenditures. So all of that benefits from that environment that's created by mass shootings occurring. Since the final solution of the gun control lobby and the mainstream media is always more central policing powers, one has to assume these entities are promoting and benefiting from the globalist agenda. Never are these bad guys with guns interested in promoting good guys with guns. They are only interested in infringing or destroying the Second Amendment and any constitutional remedy for mass shootings or terrorism. Mayor Bloomberg, why, why, why can you defend yourself but not the majority of Americans? I mean, look at, look at the team of security you got. And you're an advocate for gun control? As mentioned, it's generally well known that Democrats tend to support the welfare state. The profit motive is also alive here because the Democrats support taxes at every transaction. Taxes by multiple governments, federal, state, county, and township, and taxes on every entity, individuals, partnerships, corporations, LLCs, trusts, foundations, estates, and even the dead. Yes, the state even taxes the assets of the dead but uses the euphemism inheritance taxes to give the illusion it's taxing the living. I mean, it's, it's, it, is it because they want expanded government? They need more money to, to get into every aspect of your life, which I think is, tends to be more. They believe they can run your life better than you can. Yes, tax and spend Democrats are hell-bent on taxing anything conceivable so they can expand the welfare state and move us more towards a socialist Marxist society, all in the name of the general welfare. Uh, socialism is, in a nutshell, it is the worship of government. It is the, uh, the belief that government is as God. Government is going to be our provider, our sustainer, our protector. We look to government for our needs. We look for government for our insurance, our retirement, our health care, uh, anything that we consider a crucial need of our lives. We look to government as the provider of that need. Marxism elevates the state to a position of superiority over the individual. And so whatever the state does is good. Government is good. It's, it's really like a, a Christian looks at God, so the Marxist socialist looks at government. And so really it is, it really could almost be classified as a religion, the worship of the state. To this end, the Dems have even converted money and insurance into taxes. Printing money, 
Fiat currency, or what the Constitution calls bills of credit, is a hidden tax. It's a tax because it destroys the citizens' purchasing power, especially citizens on fixed incomes. A film entitled Fiat Empire goes into the details. We've never had the situation we have today where the entire world is running on fiat money, and that means pyramiding of debt and fraction reserve banking, uh, control by special interests, bail out the rich and punish the poor. So there's a ton of debt, but there's a ton of malinvestment. And uh, it's nice when it's going up and the bubble is being blown up and there seems to be prosperity, but it's all bar on borrowed money. It's all on inflated currency. The fiat money system is a means of stealing the, the wealth of working citizens because the cost of living goes up, the price of everything goes up. So at the end of your life, you've, uh, you've lost all of your savings purchasing power and that purchasing bar power goes someplace. It goes to the government and it goes to the banks. That's really what the Federal Reserve System is. It's a partnership between the government and the banks. They benefited from our lost purchasing power. So uh, it's a tax, it's a hidden tax. Mandatory insurance on health care and automobiles is also a hidden tax because a tax is any sum extracted by the state at gunpoint. When mass shootings increase, psychiatric drug pushers and their suppliers in Big Pharma never advocate an increase in good guys with guns. Instead, they partner with the state and force citizens to buy ever more health insurance while pushing the lie your prices will not increase. This is a non-competitive system. It's a, if you were a pharmaceutical company and uh, you wanted to make a huge profit on some drug that cost you eight, eight cents to produce and you wanted to sell it for $80, let's say, all you have to do is go to Congress and say, well, this is a valuable drug and we want you to uh, take care of the American people and see that the poor people uh, can get these valuable drugs uh, paid for by the government. And so the politicians say, well, how much did you contribute to my campaign this year? And uh, they said, well, we contributed $150,000. And then the politicians say, of course, you've got a great idea there. I think we should protect the common people. And so they pass a law that says this drug will be covered by your taxes and so forth. And so the people are so happy. They get this little eight cent bottle of pills and and they didn't have to pay anything for it. And I see $80 on the price tag and said, oh, this is wonderful. I didn't have to pay $80. And they don't realize that they did pay $80 for it because their taxes went up or inflation went up to steal their purchasing power. They're paying that $80, even though they think the government is paying it. Anti-competition colluding insurance companies in each state then rape and pillage the sick poor and mentally ill by getting them hooked on antidepressant meds with endless side effects. What happens to many patients is they get a drug, let's say an eight-year-old gets Ritalin or Adderall or some other stimulant drug, then can't sleep at night because of it and is put on a sedative drug and then starts to get irritable and agitated from both drugs and is then put on an antipsychotic drug and we know from follow-ups of children in the 70s who started on Ritalin, many of them end up on multiple psychiatric drugs with reduced quality of life by any measurement you can make from jail time and mental hospital time to income and obesity. Yeah, I think that our society is grossly over-medicated with the psychotropic drugs um, and, and an obvious consequence is an increase in the mass shootings. So, uh, yeah, so I think we need to look at the drugs and need to put that front and center. Given this, it's no conspiracy theory that greed and socialized medicine are contributing to the mass murder of citizens and the expansion of the police state. Some conspiracies are factual. Some conspiracies are not. And then in the middle, we have conspiracies which are subject of suspicion, and that's what one could call a conspiracy theory. I have a reason for believing that a conspiracy exists. This is my theory. I then take that theory, subject it to the laws of evidence, investigation, and so forth and so on, and it may be proven as a conspiracy fact, a fact of conspiracy, or it may be disproven. 
There's no question that conspiracies exist in politics and all sorts of other areas. I mean, for instance, we have the Sherman Act, contracts, combinations, and conspiracies in restraint of trade. It's even a statute of the United States, right? There are many other statutes of the United States that deal with conspiracies. But what is a conspiracy? It's when two or more people act in concert through legal means to achieve an illegal end or through illegal means to achieve even a legal end or, a, or through illegal means to achieve an illegal end. Does that happen every day in the real world? Of course it does. So when people simply dismiss as conspiracy theories an explanation or a suspicion of what is going on, they're really being extraordinarily naive or they are attempting to, uh, shall we say, deflect investigation from something that should be investigated. And the more the gun control lobby-inspired conspirators are able to grind down the population with psych drugs, Marxist-infested schools, and fiat currency-generated debt, the greater the health of the Democrats' welfare state and the health of the GOP's warfare state, as Randolph Bourne might have said in 1918. It's all related, and we've covered it in Original Intent and Spoiler, two films not coming to a theater near you. Citizen cinema, in which the common citizen journalist on the street, or with his own YouTube channel or website, is vastly more values-driven and interesting than anything coming out of Hollywood these days. In short, the two-party system the founders frowned upon supports a globalist agenda that could be summed up bad guys with guns. Bush one, Clinton one, Bush two, Obama and Clinton two are all CFR infested bad boys with guns serving the globalist agenda. This is why progressives and establishment Republicans in the DC swamp and the mainstream media are furious about the Trump revolution. Along comes somebody who has not been part of the establishment, Donald Trump, somebody who has had to fight both Democrat and Republicans alike, uh, who are part of the same inbred establishment. And when he talks as if he's rejecting that establishment line, that they're the only ones who are entitled to rule, and that they've done a lousy job to boot, uh, that clearly resonated with voters who had either never voted before or who hadn't voted for a long time and decided, well, I'll finally give the political system another shot. I'll give them another chance. And I think that's how Donald Trump got elected. Globalists need to confiscate weapons from Americans so the U.S. can be brought under their control. Mass shootings and all manner of other terrorist acts serve to justify the confiscation of weapons. Were we the people to see merit in good guys with guns, take back the power of the sword, and remedy mass shootings? The what? when, where, how, who, and why of mass shootings and terrorist attacks would unravel. If the people in this country were to recognize the necessity of getting back to the founder's plan, the necessity of a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, if they were to do that, that would throw a massive monkey wrench into the plans of the, the globalist oligarchy because they want disarmed populations that are easy to control and they want solidification of power. The more power is solidified, once again, easier for them to control. They have a few people to control at the top rather than the entire population. The last thing they want is that for the power of the person, the sword of money or, or military power to be diffused among the people. That's why they don't want sound money, that's why they don't want a militia. So um, I think we should do what they don't want. Whatever they, you know, whatever they fear, that's what we should do. So it's, in, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we take personal responsibility in our neighborhoods, neighborhood watch I think is essential, in our churches, a church security team, go armed in your church, go armed at all times, be responsible, be a responsible member of your community who's able to defend wherever you are, a coffee shop, an outdoor concert, um, in a school, wherever you are going to be, you need to be able to, be, to step up and be the defender. And you should be going to your schools and advocating that if you're a trained veteran, military police veteran, you should go volunteer and advocate for arming and, tra and training the teachers. And if you have the qualifications that help do that, then you should be the instructor and go volunteer your time to teach the teachers and teach the staff. And call on your governor to you know, revitalize the militia in your state. And you should call on the president to call you up as a military veteran or police veteran um, into service as the militia. And we've advocated for the same thing. 
calling on President Trump to call us up as the militia to secure the border or to secure the schools. So the control motive is the senior motive of the globalists, the bad guys with guns. To the collectivists who run the world's major foundations, control is sweeter than profit or politics, and that control is what the globalists call the New World Order. Actually, the real New World Order occurred in 1776, when the founders gave we the people the U.S. Constitution and the Second Amendment, recognizing for the first time ever the God-given inalienable right of self-defense against tyranny. The globalists want a return to the old world order, a despotic era of disarmed populations and endless government slaughter. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. A world order in which the principles of justice and fair play protect the weak against the strong. A world where the United Nations, freed from Cold War stalemate, is poised to fulfill the historic vision of its founders. A world in which freedom and respect for human rights find a home among all nations. Globalism is the total control over the world economy. It is very difficult for international bankers, financiers, merchants, etc to make the kind of money that they want to make, even though they're making billions and billions now. And nationhood is an impediment to a global economy. It is a series of red tape uh, taxes involved, and, and there's uh, imposts and duties and tariffs, and there's all kinds of, of mechanisms in place at the various national levels to make it more difficult for the international merchants to make profits. So their ultimate goal is to eliminate national borders so that they can have a true global economy of which they control. But obviously in order to have a global economy you have to have a global army to maintain it, to protect it, to enforce it. Obviously, when you start putting that much power in the hands of a selected number of soldiers and military personnel, it multiplies the propensity for abuse. I mean, if you think that individual nations can be abusive, that few number of people expanding it over an entire planet under one authority under one command, the, the, the propensity for devastation would be horrific. Thanks to the Second Amendment, 100 million law-abiding gun owners stand between liberty and a one-world government ruled by an unelected elite of bad guys with guns. So, if you are abhorred by the nature of government, what you saw at the beginning of this film, universal gun control proposed by the globalists should really concern you. For what makes one think that even the United States is exempt from the nature of government? Ruby Ridge, Waco, Kent State, and other smaller ones that didn't get uh, too much press. But you know what? The Second Amendment was aimed at preventing tyrannical government. Who's the only entity who has tried to disarm American citizens. Chicago government, New York government, Los Angeles government, California government. My job as a peace officer is to protect your rights from government. In the Declaration of Independence, the founding fathers state that when any form of government becomes destructive of the ends for which government is created, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. So they understood that even the form of government that they were creating in the states and then the Articles of Confederation, eventually the Constitution, might become capable of that kind of activity. And that's why they said later on in the Declaration that when that type of thing happens, it is the right and the duty of the people 
to abolish that form of government and create a new government. So it certainly is possible in theory that under the Constitution, the government of the United States, the government of the states in conjunction with it, could become tyrannical. And then you would ask the question, well, where in the Constitution is the power lodged to deal with that type of situation? You don't want to go back to the Declaration of Independence situation where you're overthrowing the government entirely and creating something entirely new. And the answer is, well, that's basically the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the maintenance of a free state, the maintenance of this constitutional free state that we have. That's what the Founding Fathers told us was the necessary institution. And our problem is that we've moved away from that institution and therefore we've really undermined the protection, the foundational protection of this entire system. Most of us acknowledge that the United States is the greatest nation ever built. Due to its Christian principles, it has helped Western civilization achieve three periods of expansion like no other. But it will not remain that way unless we the people maintain the pillars that support its principles. And words are like pillars. Thus, all the words of the Second Amendment, especially the first 13, must be supported. A well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. Uh, the reason uh, we the people are, are guaranteed uh, the right to keep and bear arms are, are several, but among the, the most important and paramount is uh, in the resistance to tyranny. Maintaining the U.S. Republic as a free state is all that prevents globalists from hijacking Western civilization and using it to consume the entire world. So, what can we do? What can we the people do to ensure good guys with guns prevail in the prevention of both tyranny and atrocities? How can we the people create a more perfect union, avoid the globalists' agenda, and make America great again? How can we change 5,000 years of brutal history and create a world where all beings can flourish and prosper in safety and security? Well, here's what comes to mind. We can better educate the population about the dangers of antidepressants and other psych drugs. We can better educate the population about the dangers of alcohol as a depressant, which serves as a major gateway to antidepressants. It disinhibits people so that they're no longer controlled by their usual morality, so that the mixing of uh, alcohol with antidepressants is a common cause of violence. We can outlaw gun-free zones and acknowledge that sometimes local protection is the only thing that works. Gun-free zones could be considered a form of mild insurrection. And therefore, well-regulated militia would need to be called forth to suppress such an insurrection. We can vote out and bring to justice rogue congressmen and judges that infringe the Second Amendment need to get back to, I think, the full Second Amendment, all 27 words of that. We can defund or close dangerous schools. Because it is impossible for the police to be everywhere, and therefore the ultimate protection for ourselves resides with ourselves. In 1856, the United States Supreme Court ruled that you cannot sue a local law enforcement agency for not responding to an emergency call. As recently as the Clinton administration, the Supreme Court upheld that ruling. So if you are in an emergency situation and you call 911 and the police never show up, you have no right to be able to sue the police, further proving that you are responsible for your own protection. We can educate the public about individualism versus collectivism, the two dominant political philosophies that are competing for our tax dollars. The idea of individualism versus collectivism basically has to do with which is the center of society, the group, or is it the individual? I believe that it's clearly the individual. It has to be the individual if we want to preserve liberty and freedom. Once we give this mythical thing, the group, some kind of a supremacy over individuals, that's the beginning of the end of personal liberty. We can revitalize the militia system with the help of organizations like Oath Keepers, the National Rifle Association, and Gun Owners of America. I think the NRA could help revitalize the militia system by first of all being willing to say the word militia, uh, making it clear that we're talking about as a public body 
uh, made up of volunteers, much like a volunteer fire department is. It's, you know, it's not just you and your buddies getting together and calling yourself the volunteer fire department. So it's under, under town or county approval and then also under the state governor. The ethos now, unfortunately, is, well, you know, you should just be, if there's a mass shooting going on, you shouldn't intervene. You should just run the other direction. Unless your family's in danger, don't engage. That's not the answer. The answer is what Stephen Williford did, which is a run towards the sound of the guns. He wasn't anywhere near, it wasn't in the bubble of, of, of the attack. It wasn't part of the, part of the uh, population being attacked. He came from the outside, like a cop would. My daughter was in the kitchen washing dishes and she came into my room in a panic and said, Dad, doesn't that sound like gunfire to you? And, and so I went into the kitchen with her and it indeed sounded like gunfire. And I told her it is gunfire and I ran to the safe. If I opened the safe up, I pulled out my rifle, I pulled out an AR-15 and a magazine and I grabbed a box of ammunition and she came running back into the house and said, Dad, there's a man in black tactical gear with a helmet and everything shooting up the church. And at that point, I'm loading rounds into a magazine and I ran out the door and my daughter followed me. And as, I, as she came out the door behind me, I turned around and looked at her and I told her, go back in the house and load me a magazine. I've only got a handful of ammunition and I may need more. In short, we can demonstrate the principle of good guys with guns by stopping mass shootings in a similar way as a constitutional militia. All of these remedies will physically help create a more perfect union, but none will do much to change the heart and spirit. To do this, we should reinstate worship in the public school system. Such worship should always be voluntary and respect no particular religion as stipulated in the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. When Engel v. Vitale was imposed by the Supreme Court in 1969, it cast a chill on religion, hence values, morals, and hope. Engel v. Vitale is one of a number of Supreme Court decisions which basically ruled the public schools cannot allow or look to or tolerate any form of religious instruction or religious observance in the course of the actual school activities. The public schools must be quote unquote neutral, it's actually not neutral, they must be antagonistic because they must exclude all of these uh, religious principles or religious practices. So it's not so much a matter that we're saying, well, on the one hand, religion is this, and on the other hand, there's this other thing. It's we can't talk about religion at all. That's out. And the consequence of that, I think, in the formative minds of young children is, well, this is something that really doesn't have a lot to do with our real lives. And when you think that through, the logical corollary to that is, well, the application of these religious principles as they inform the moral and ethical principles, that's all irrelevant too. What, what they really took out was the respect for God inside the public schools. There's still, of course, exceptions to that where individual teachers, individual communities may have still this day a healthy respect for our Creator and respect for eternal principles, etc. But if we can reinstill in the hearts of our boys and girls that healthy, reverent respect, that would return us to where we were before all of this began. It is no coincidence that shortly after religion was removed from public schools, mass shootings and other forms of violence escalated. The secular may argue, but the fact is, the United States was founded as a Christian nation, meaning it was heavily populated by Protestants and its constitution was significantly informed by biblical principles. In fact, Western civilization, the host for the U.S. empire, is known as Christendom. America is often referred to as a Christian nation. It is a Christian nation historically in the sense that it was created by mostly Christian people and upon the principles of God's natural laws. 
It was not created as a theocracy. It was not created as a, uh, a, a, a popish state or a Protestant state or any other religious state. That was the propensity of European nations previous to America coming into existence. I mean, let's face it, the, the Puritans and pilgrims fled Europe, came to this continent seeking religious freedom. They were commanded by their governments to worship a certain way, to support a certain church or denomination. Taxes were collected from them and then given to church denominations. So in, it, it, we are a, a nation built up by Christian men upon biblical natural law principles, but we are a nation of religious liberty. John Adams, one of our founding fathers, put it this way, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. John Adams, he was right when he talked about we needed to have a, a religious backbone, I guess, in order to understand the Constitution. Uh, if we don't have, you know, basic, uh, uh, some spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ in our heart, I, and we evidently we can't see good, and if we can't see good, we can't understand the Constitution, I'm sure of that. But I do believe the Constitution was made for all people, and not only the, all people of America, but I believe it would work anywhere in the world. If Adams is correct, and he is, worship in the schools should serve to remind children that there are values that supersede Hollywood values. Are you flirting with me? <laughs> Does Hollywood have any values? <laughs> you know, Mel Gibson came out here just a few weeks ago. He said that, that the values of, of, of Hollywood were, were absolutely in, in the toilet. Hollywood is a good example of hypocrisy at its most uh, impressive display. Uh, Hollywood uh, makes lots of money using guns in really uh, promiscuous fashion. And then they turn around and lecture their audience with how naughty they are to carry a gun personally. Hollywood uh, really is the epitome of hypocrisy. A thousand studies indicate violent movies and video games have desensitized the youth to the point whereby many are cold and mean to each other, often talking only through cell phones and other electronic gadgets. Uh, we see the, the same actions coming out of our children that you see in the, the violence of the video games. So we, we're in a situation where uh, the children are exposed to only that one emotion uh, and it, it is materializing in their day-to-day -day actions. Add to this the endless consumption of beer, wine, hard stuff, opioids, and you have a Molotov cocktail just waiting to be ignited by Big Pharma's sight drugs. Right now we face a crisis in broken homes and single parents and uh, public school system solving this problem it seems to make it worse. Uh, the um, uh, the, the students don't seem to uh, grasp and get hold of the alternatives. Is it any wonder mass shooters are often quiet, lonely, and lost children, rejected or ridiculed by their movie indoctrinated peers? In their depressed minds, what recourse do they have other than drugs or suicide? And when such a child decides to end his life, often his last impulse is to also end the lives of those who abused, bullied, or ostracized him. We both had the same style rifles. And uh, he did horrible, evil things with his. I used mine to stop him. There's a very definite difference between a good guy with a gun and a bad guy with a gun. It's a, it's a matter of, of heart. What has happened to our culture that not just kids, but adults have lost 
the natural love, compassion, empathy for one another that God put in our hearts. Love, care, and concern cannot be created by the state. This is why human beings created the church. This is where lost children can begin to get back on the path of hope and sanity. We really need to consider the very stressful lives that our children are leading. Their schools are exhausting them. They have too much homework. They don't have enough sports or activity. They don't get outdoors enough. Not enough people from the community come in. They're too insulated. They're too involved then with themselves on social media. They're too remote from their parents because now they're spending so much time at school, so much time studying, and then so much time on social media that they're hardly being brought up by their parents at all. 6.32 a.m., these kids probably got five or six hours of sleep where they were required to get up, traipse through this inclement, foggy, cold, miserable morning and get on a school bus. And you heard one of the kids say it was 6.32. That is ridiculous. That is child abuse. Uh, our children are horribly bullied. Uh, the instances of bullying in schools is, uh, uh, again, something I think they've created a situation that, that fosters these things that we're seeing. So our, our, our kids really do need to be underpinned by those things in life that, that promote virtuousness, that, that make them good neighbors, good friends, and ultimately good parents. The kids of America can make this happen if they put down the vices and pick up the will to change their hearts and spirit. Good Guys with Guns is a modern parallel to the militia system used by our colonists for more than 300 years with virtually no mass shootings. Good guys and good gals serve as a demonstration of self-government through self-protection, hence a renunciation of the globalist agenda and the collectivist political philosophy that underlies it. In short, revitalization of a constitutional militia system as we covered in Molan Le Bay and Midnight Ride, is the ultimate way to maintain a self-governing and self-protecting nation. Well, the militia date all the way back to Great Britain, uh, but in the colonies, the militia began, I believe, in Massachusetts in basically the early to mid-17th century when the Massachusetts militia participated in a war against the Pequot Indians. Initially, militias consisted of all able-bodied men in the community who could keep and bear arms to protect the community, to assist the community when crisis came, and to defend it against foreign and hostile elements. And frankly, up until the Revolutionary War, they were by and large battling Indians and, uh, and marauders and others. Then during the Revolutionary War, they were brought together into a Continental Army under General Washington. Unfortunately, Due to rogue politicians, tyrants, and usurpers embedded in the gun control lobby, the mainstream media, and the D.C. swamp, revitalization could take time. The goal of militia revitalization, however, can be approached by demonstrating militia system principles and how they can be effectively applied to the mass shooting epidemic. You can't have a militia made up of the people themselves with the constitutional competence to execute the laws of the union on the one side and politicians supposedly representing the people but actually betraying them on the other, on the other side. One of those two has to prevail. So of course the politicians will say, well, we don't want the militia at all. Because if the militia is revitalized, that will be the end of the rogue politicians. Some, however, feel dispensing with guns, especially weapons of war, is the only answer. This is unfortunate because such a solution would once again expose citizens to the government tyrannies we have seen over the centuries. Would we really want to risk a repeat of the mass slaughter we saw from bad guys with guns in Stalin's Russia or Hitler's Nazi Germany? If not, 
This leaves us with the only practical solution we have. Replace gun-free zones with good guy zones. That's the core purpose. And if we allow ourselves to sacrifice that on the altar of supposed security, as Ben Franklin said, you'll wind up with neither. So the only way to have security and liberty is to understand our individual responsibility to be the militia of the people and take that very seriously. And take it seriously right now as an individual, even before you can get your town council or your county commissioners or your state legislature to formally establish a militia, you can still get together and train like we've done. We've offered our protection and, and successfully protected multiple free speech events against Antifa over the last couple of years. Um, we protected, we offered to protect the Border Patrol and uh, ICE families who were under threat from radical leftists. And at this time, we're also offering our, our protection to any of the politicians out there in the Trump administration or elsewhere who are being threatened by radical leftists and trying to be intimidated. Once Americans see a demonstration of how good guys with guns can provide constitutional homeland security, it may serve to revitalize interest in the militia system that worked for 300 years and works in Switzerland this very day. It may also serve to reduce the police and surveillance state we have been drifting towards post 9-11 for the endless expansion of government is the essence of the globalist agenda. We need to reestablish a limited government and a free state of which the Founding Fathers would approve. And we can do it. For the dream of one of those Founding Fathers, Thomas Paine, was that we can begin the world over again. And this hope, spoken or unspoken, continues every day with the breath of every citizen in the United States of America. Payne, it was an eloquent and courageous champion of liberty during the founding generation. He speaks very reverently of the providence of God. Later, we know that he, he wrote the book, uh, The Age of Reason, and was critical of Christianity. And for that, uh, many rejected Paine's philosophy at that point. But what people don't realize is that the, he had repented and recanted uh, the age of reason. In fact, he said, quote, I would give worlds if the age of reason had never been published. Leaving that aside, Thomas Paine was one of the greatest founding fathers. His pamphlet, Common Sense, extremely influential, helping to rally support for America's break of Great Britain. For we the people formed the greatest self-governing, self-defending, and self-repairing nation the world has ever seen. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.